Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am here today with Jason Edmonds from Edmonds Creative. He is a singer-songwriter. He's also uh, an artist manager for his daughter, and he has written a book, which we'll talk about in a minute, which is really cool. It's about AI and how that can help you with your release process, and you guys know I'm really big on the release process. So we'll get into that in a minute. Um, But before we do, I'd love to know, Jason, just a bit about your journey, and don't feel like you have to you know keep it short people are always very interested in the journey of artists and and, you know how you kind of ended up here today with working with your daughter and AI and all that but let's hear about your your artistic journey first okay all right well thanks for asking for that I'll try to keep it as brief as possible so how do I break down 25 26 years of being in Los Angeles. I'm originally from Indianapolis and I came out to LA originally for school. I attended UCLA's uh, extension program and did engineering there. But while I was there in school, I got a record deal uh, with a group of friends of mine uh, and we were signed to Interscope Records in a group called it was called Neutral. And um, like a lot of artists that get signed, uh, we ran into some creative issues. Uh, Interscope change it was a change of the guard, and they brought in new A and Rs, and you know those signed to the old you know administration were amicably uh, released, and we were one of those groups, unfortunately. But you know, fortunately, I would say then on the flip side of that, it did push me more into songwriting and producing. And um, I I started writing songs. I got a studio at my family's building on on, uh, Cahuenga. It was called Edmonds Tower. And I there wrote songs for Whitney Houston, wrote songs for Boys to Men and Tank and Tyrese and Jojo and uh, some hip hop like Scarface and Raekwon and uh, Too Short and a bunch of different songs. And that lasted up until about the time Napster and LimeWire hit. <laughs> and um you know as like with everyone else you know things slowed down significantly and i started to you know kind of pivot and more get more involved in business and uh trying to understand the mechanics behind the industry not so much just from the creative side and just depending on someone to make the right choices for me or try to advise me and you know and push me in the right direction i wanted to kind of be that person because i felt like a lot of my experiences up until that point were kind of on my own and i didn't have that you know uh, leadership and on my team and on my squad to help us. So I began learning and trying to understand the business. Um, and the first activation was kind of outside of music, but still involving music. A group of friends of mine and I uh, got a licensing deal from Rolling Stone and opened an 11,000 square foot restaurant in Hollywood uh, called Rolling Stone. And it was awesome. (laughs) We did a lot of parties, a lot of events. It was a a restaurant and a club at the bottom. So we had all kinds of events from, you know, movie premieres because we were at Hollywood and Highland and we had the, the, uh, the, um, Chinese theater next door. So we got a lot of the after parties from there. And, uh, from that, you know, I gained a lot of contacts. And so, you know, furthering my business endeavors, I guess it was, you know, really, I fastly found out that it was largely dependent upon relationships and how well you cultivate them and how they grow over time. And it's funny, we we booked Macy Gray one night uh, as a DJ and uh, we both laugh about it now. But, you know, cut to four years after that night, I'm her manager <laughs> and we're out on the road. And I said, Mace, do you remember the night we met? And there's just this long funny stories that we have with one another, but it was really through that club and through, um, you know, me meeting people and, and telling them about my personal background, because all they knew me for at that point was just the club guy. I was just the club guy. But when they found out I had, you know, this musical background, I gained a lot of friends. 
And so I've had a wonderful time since then being involved in various projects from tech startups to, you know, writing for television and film as well and selling a couple of uh, scripts to uh, writing a book recently, like you mentioned. So that's uh, that's pretty that's a pretty good journey right there. Yeah, no, that is that's you've you've been in a lot of segments of the music industry, which is interesting and gives uh -huh. you a lot to be able to to mentor people on. And it's it's cool because now you've got your 25 year old daughter, right? And you're helping her with her career. I am. So I had her around the time I was signed to Interscope. <laughs> so <laughs> you see how stories begin to intertwine. And so we, you know, along her journey, uh, you know, again, okay, so one thing you didn't acknowledge, Bree, and I don't know if you're aware of, is that I'm from a musical family. Mm -hmm. My uncle's Kenny Babyface Edmonds. My father was in a group called After Seven in the in the 90s. They were, you know, one of the well-known groups in the R&B world. And... I remember them for sure. Okay. Okay. I see you got the Michael Jackson stuff behind yes. you and the guitar. So you know, you know what's going on. So, um, yeah, we just, you know, we had a musical family. And so I, one of the things that I kind of wish that happened when in my childhood was that I'd be pushed more in a musical direction instead of kind of hands off and kind of seeing what happens and then maybe helping along the way. So I, I'm trying to be more involved uh, than my uh, predecessors uh, were with me. So uh, yes, she is 25. She's amazing. She's a vocalist and a writer. And, um, you know, like the lifestyle in LA and anyone else, she's working a job. <laughs> she's in, She just graduated from uh, uh, Santa Monica. She's an esthetician and she, and she does music in her spare time. Mm, and we're really to smart. Build. And what's yeah. your daughter's name? Her name is Jalen. Jalen. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, and does, and does she accept your, your help and, and your opinion <laughs> pretty well? <laughs> that was a question that only a parent would know to ask. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, no, <laughs> she fights me on everything, but I, you know, dad ends up being right. Uh, I don't have to rub it in her face. She just admits it and she, you know, says, okay, okay, okay. But no, we, you know, she's very headstrong. She knows what she wants. She goes after it and I let her do it. And then uh, if she needs me along the way, I'm here. That's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. And I, I definitely want to get to the stuff in your book uh, in a minute with the AI, because I know it's going to be amazingly helpful to the artist. But I did want to talk about, you know, your daughter being a 25-year-old a female artist how do you differentiate yourself in this landscape? You know, female artists are so big right now with Taylor Swift and Olivia um, Rodrigo. And, you know, how do you, how do you stand out? Yeah, that's, yes, <laughs> that's the answer. <laughs> um, it is a combination of finding what is unique inside of you and, and her and her regard. So we spend a lot of time recording, a lot of time writing. She works with a number of different people. Uh, that are trying to give her that identifiable sound. Fortunately for her, she does come a family of uh, come from a family that can open doors rel relatively quickly. But it's very important for us to do the work, mm -hmm. and that's what I hit home with her right now. Doing the work is not only beneficial to you and getting yourself confident in who you are, but it also helps to identify your unit your uniqueness as well. And if you can identify, and that becomes clear to you what your uniqueness is, it's usually seen by others as well. So you don't you don't have to spend so much time trying to explain what's unique about you, it's kind of obvious when you walk through the door or when you press play. And that's what we aim for there because I come from a school of, you don't even begin the meeting until after you press play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the meeting- yeah, I think that's good. Uh, but yeah. I think um, at least artists I work with, they have a really hard time seeing what's unique about them. Sometimes we just can't get outside of ourselves. Uh, do you have kind of a process- other than you kind of helping with that, because you have that outside perspective yeah. of getting other people's opinions on what's unique. Yeah. I don't know if my perspective is so unique or my process is so unique, but I will say that, um, you know, there are some artists that lead with one thing or another. There are artists that lead with their performance, right, which seems to be kind of... Um, a common thing going on right now. Um, there's artists that lead with their uh, vocal tone. There's artists that leads with their lyrics or their uh, musicianship. My daughter leads with vocals. And that to me kind of sets her apart from what I'm seeing a lot of today uh, in itself, because 
you named two fabulous artists, actually, Olivia Rodrigo, who I think is a fabulous singer, and um, Taylor Swift, who is also a fabulous singer. But I don't think either one of them two are best known for their vocals, you know. And so, you know, but when you say Whitney Houston or when you say maybe Ariana Grande or Mariah Carey, or people like that, I think the first thing that comes to mind are the vocals. And so, because I think that is the strongest part about what she has to offer as an artist, I think that's what we concentrate most heavily on and try to cultivate that and build that and make her stronger and just exercise that as much as possible. And what is your opinion about getting a record deal in 2024? I mean, you've been through this process and, you know, had to deal with the changing of the guard and all that stuff. Do you <laughs> think it's even important to do that nowadays? Or can you just really make your way as an individual? I am glad you asked that question. <laughs> that is the one of the subjects in a, a new book that I'm writing, actually. Okay, so I am of the mindset that unless you're well-funded as an artist, record deals are still very necessary. Are they mandatory like they used to be in the 80s and 90s? No, you know, you've got the automated platforms now that will distribute your music and promote and, and, you know, create, give you tools to utilize. So no, it's not mandatory that you sign to a record deal, but I always tell clients as I'm, you know, consulting and, you know, moving around the industry still that you, if you're going to do it yourself, you need to reserve enough budget to be able to do it the right way and to compete against those that do have the budget and the labels that are putting out music. It is still a money-driven industry. It is a business, you know, and you will never outspend <laughs> a, a label. You will never outspend Universal. But in order to be um, recognized in the fray, right, or, or we can call it minutia if we're cynic, right? If if you're if you're to be recognized in the professional realm you need to be able to promote the exact same way. Maybe not to the exact same degree, but you need to promote the same way. And that way requires a budget. So that's the long answer to your question. I apologize, but I do think labels will still be necessary for some time. I mean, I think that's, that is a good point. It, I guess it depends on what level you're trying to be at. That's you know, true. if you just want to put your music out and you want to play and, you know, get enough people to come to your concerts and, and make a decent living and you can do it all independently, right? But you're not going to yeah. compete on the level of Olivia Rodrigo. That's right. That's right. And, and and fine. There there are some artists that are really just okay with making a living. They they they're such art are art, art, artists in themselves, pure artists, right? Mm -hmm. That they just want a platform to be able to, you know, create and share their gift with the world. That doesn't require millions and millions of fans, right? You can do that with a thousand people and live a, you know, decent, you know, I don't know exactly what the income level would be at that point. But you can be happy doing that. And that's fine. I tend to meet and run in the circles of people who want to compete with the Olivia Rodrigo's. Mm -hmm. So that's the perspective I speak from particularly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've seen it happen. So why not? You know, why not go for it? I have. And I know it's possible. And I've seen it happen enough times without a label up until a point that a label needs to step in and get involved and then take over from there which is also a strategy too for some of my clients that I work with is that, okay, you know, we can't just go walk in and get a deal right now. It's 2024. I don't care. I mean, unless you're Prince or somebody just that musically prolific, nobody's going to walk in a label and just get a deal off of their talent anymore. But you can build your offering and your um, visibility up enough to where labels will now come to you. And there are people at labels that are hired specifically to track artists that are unsigned that are doing significant numbers and mm -hmm. if they reach a certain threshold that label will offer you a deal you know to what size and to what amount and all that kind of stuff is all negotiable but i've seen people lose their job if they didn't go after an artist that was doing significant numbers and another label swooped in and got them and they didn't jump in the fight and try to get them themselves yeah well, speaking of those numbers i know that recently Spotify came out with a, with a whole new set of rules. <laughs> yeah. um, what, you know, what is your opinion about that? How's that going to affect, especially the independent artists? Because I know the people I'm working with are freaking out about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So let me help them feel a little bit better about it. Okay. 
So first of all, you know, I think the threshold is a thousand streams, right? Mm -hmm. Within a year's time, even just within Spotify alone, there are tools. Again, it requires a little bit of a budget. But there are tools that you can use in Spotify, fan builder campaigns, discovery ads, all of these other tools that within Spotify that you can use to promote. And you should be able to hit a thousand streams pretty easily if you if you maybe take your time to study exactly what it is it's doing and how to use it effectively. You should be able to hit a thousand streams pretty good, right? And let's say, let's say Spotify isn't your focus. Right. Let's say you went on DistroKid and maybe you're finding that your audience lives most heavily on Pandora or maybe you're an, you're an Instagram or, or a TikTok type of person. A lot of the tools today are designed to spread widely. They will spread you around. They won't just run ads on a on a particular platform. Um, and speaking of AI, one one good one is called Ad Creative. Ad Creative will actually create your ad for you based on your music and your prompt and then tell you where it should go. And when you utilize a tool like that, usually it's pretty easy to get over a thousand streams on any platform. As long as you staying or you're staying on it it's it's odd to us to to think though that you know i think spotify said two million songs are uploaded a month now something like that but 70 to 75 percent of those uploads have zero streams it's bizarre so you're like uploading your own music but you're not even playing it yourself <laughs> that's crazy that's crazy that does so, seem like a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, I'm not mad at the new rules. Uh, you know, Apple Music for many years had a threshold. You had to generate a certain amount of revenue for, in order for them to pay out. And I get it. It's a business. I don't want to be writing a bunch of $3 checks. You know what I'm saying? So while I can see it being frustrating for new artists just getting started, I urge those artists to utilize the tools that are available for them on those platforms. And you will get past that threshold relatively easy. They're not very hard to overcome. Yeah, just I kind of them. agree. I kind of agree that it's like, if you're not really going to try hard to generate a thousand streams for your song. Why are you doing this? I mean, yeah. I'm not trying to insult any of you guys that are listening, but right. you know, it is a business. And if your goal is to get people to listen to your music and you haven't gotten 1000 plays and that could be a hundred plays from 10 people, you yeah. know, um, it's, <laughs> it, it, you gotta, you gotta do something about that. So I, I agree. I understand why Spotify does it. Like he said, there's so many songs that are just not even played at all. Like they're just junking up the system. Yeah. And so I'm glad that they're doing it personally. Yeah. But so you mentioned kind of that one of those AI tools that you can use for ads Mm -hmm. I would love for you to talk, just give some overviews on your book and, and tell tell them why they should read your book, because it sounds like it's got a lot of really specific tools that they can use, especially during the release process that are going to help you hit that thousand streams and more. Yeah. So the book um, in itself is really about my conversations with AI. And mm -hmm. I want to ask the relevant questions that all artists and managers ask to a, to chat GBT and Bard and other AI platforms to try to find the answers that at least they say or that that they give advice for it because a lot of times we think we know the right ways but until you actually know what the algorithms are written to do and to uh, look for specifically it's hard to navigate throughout some of these things like a lot of one of these things on on instagram is about how you optimize the algorithm or how you get so if i have a thousand followers on instagram and i go and post something right now only a small percentage of the people that actually follow me will even see it now there are ways that the algorithm uh, reacts to content to open that gate to more and more people even you know uses outside of yourself so i digress back to the book when I started out writing it, <laughs> it was really about, I actually came up with the idea to write the book based on my interactions with chat. And I was like, well, wait a minute, I can like ask this machine, like, what are the best ways to promote my album? See what it says, because I know the answer. Let me see if it knows the answer. Right. And then I would get the answer and I'd be like, yeah, that's, 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 that's right. And so the book is formatted like me asking a question, getting uh, the answers from chat and or Bard, and then me talking about it. Mm. And sometimes I disagree. So one question I asked in the book was, you know, if you are the, you know, top manager in, in the music business, 
how would you budget out, you know, $100,000, I think it was in the book. And it told me what it would do. And I was like, nope, <laughs> no, don't do that. No, nope, you know, and, uh, you know, so that's really what the book is about. But there are wonderful AI tools today. And I asked chat to identify those platforms. But I also said in the book, because this book came out in August and it was written between January and March of last year, right? I said that by the time you read this book, 90% <laughs> of the platforms that I mentioned right now will either be gone or outperformed by some other AI, you know, platform that is far superior to anything that exists right now. And that's exactly what has happened. Mm. The my favorite platform today for AI, uh, creating uh, music with AI is Udio. I've UD never really heard of that. Okay. Yes. U-D-I-O. Okay. Last week, Bree, I'm sitting at the computer friend of mine sent me this link and I said, huh, let me check it out because I, I check them all out just to see. And you go to the site, it asks you for um, like a four bar lyric, right? So I did a little, because I love 90s music. Uh, uh, I love my 90s, something, 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 something. And then I said, create me a song that has elements of a uh, Chris Brown meets Teddy Riley or something like that, I think I said, right? It gave me two versions that were actually very good. I It scared the crap out of me. One of my good friends, his name is Mars. Uh, he belongs to a crew called 1500. I sent it to him right away. I said, Mars, you have to check this out right now because this is actually good. N not only does it like spit it out in 30 seconds, which they all do, and it's impressive. A lot of them are like obscure or just like you could never really use it. Kind of even made specifically for sync like a television or commercial type of thing it can never be like on a major release no these songs were like on par with what you know my friends are producing yeah with just a few changes a little tweak here and there that's a done record i was like it didn't had a female singing the lyrics that i had written it expanded on my lyrics and wrote a whole song i said oh it's over <laughs> it's over i couldn't believe it i couldn't believe it wow so yeah, check that one out for those that are interested. Um, but I think I know what your next question is going to be, uh, be, Bri. So go ahead. Oh, you do? <laughs> okay, now, now I'm going to come up with a different one. No, I, actually, <laughs> I was just going to say, I think it was really smart for you to base the book around the prompts that you wrote. Because if you just were to write a book about, you know, what what do you do in the music industry right now? How do you, you know, we've all written those books, right? How, how yeah. do we release music? It's going to be yeah. outdated. But if you write the prompts, then they can just put those prompts in and a year from now, it's going to give them a little bit of a different answer. That's correct. That's Super correct. smart. Okay. Um, what I wanted to know is uh, what, how you disagreed with what it said to do with the hundred thousand dollars. And oh, you know, okay. why do you think it was wrong? Okay. So one of the major parts I disagreed with was merch. So a lot of times, and even artists that I will come encounter with coming into contact with now, sorry, <clears throat> Um, all want to do merch, which I think is wonderful. And I think it's a great uh, ancillary source of uh, uh, revenue that an artist can create for themselves along the single releasing process. However, I'm not a fan of backstock. I'm not a fan of going to downtown LA, ordering 300 t-shirts, mm. buying a silkscreen machine and doing it yourself and waiting for somebody to order it and filling orders. I'm, uh, that, that, that plan is, is outdated. Um, so I'm a big fan of drop shipping and AI, um, for some reason at the time, there's their their plan was a traditional order mm -hmm. and fill um, merch process, which is very costly. You know, it can be ten thousand dollars, you know, uh, whereas drop shipping doesn't really cost you anything. You know, you can create the the uh, image on a with AI. You can use a platform like Spod, put that image onto the T-shirt, link your uh, Spod to your Shopify, sell it right on your website, do a single release and a, and a T-shirt drop right along with it at the same time, you know. Yeah, no, um, I totally agree. So did you say that's called Spot? Spod, S-P-O-D. Spod, I haven't heard of that one. I, I know that like things like Printful and stuff do something yes. similar. Yes. Yeah, there's several of them now. Yeah. Bot. yeah. Okay. Definitely good to know that one for everybody. And I agree. Like, why should we create all this stuff in advance? And, you know, also we don't have to, we have to carry it all around everywhere. You know, it's yeah. really annoying. So that's right. 
I'm kind of glad that 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 season is over with the merch. Yeah, but that was one area. Another area, if you want me to continue. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, another area was that a lot of artists, if you, you have a budget, you don't include proper financial management. Mm. And that just didn't exist in the budget that, that AI brought forth. And I thought that that was, you know, very important to include because while, you know, everybody tries to use the traditional, okay, if I write a song with them and I make $10, they're going to get five. But what happens when you've got two or three writers? Um, what happens when like that song gets licensed or what happens when there's all these other like what ifs that come into play and some of your revenue payouts can become very complicated. Mm. Um, if an artist owns, so, okay, if Bree, if you and I write a song, but I wrote 90% of it and you wrote the hook in 10%, I'm going to always keep track of that 10% and pay you that exact amount. How do you know I'm paying you the right amount? Am I presenting you any sort of like monthly printout that shows you um, what revenues were made? No, no artist does that ever. <laughs> so, you know, Having something in place that um, manages the financial payouts throughout a releasing process is very important. And for that, would you use like a software or would you get like an, a person, like a, a publishing administrator? I would prefer a person just because then, you know, they can make certain decisions, but you can easily do this in QuickBooks. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, you need to know how to use QuickBooks. Right. <laughs> it can be kind of difficult. And most artists are very like, I don't want to use QuickBooks, yeah. you know. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Totally. Yeah. Well, yeah. okay. Give us some other ideas of, as far as like the release process, what they can use when it comes to AI, that's going to be helpful. Just maybe like categories. You don't have to go into like specifics. Cause as you said, they like, they change all the time, but what categories of things can AI help you with? Okay. So the, the, the biggest thing is ads. That's like the hardest thing to really do without AI because you need to be a designer of some sorts or you have to go to Fiverr or one of these platforms to get ads created for you. So I love um, Ad Creative. I think it's AI. It's an AI machine. That's a great platform. Uh, um, there's another one. Let me get the name. It, uh, it's slipping my mind. So this one is about how you um, spread the music widely. So rather than going with a distro kid or United Masters or, you know, any like TuneCore, CD any of them. Yeah. 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 CD Baby. Uh -huh. Rather than going with them, you can go with, um, oh, Lord, I don't know. Tell your listeners to message me and I'll tell them what I remember. <laughs> <the name. laughs> I'm so sorry. But research this. I'm They're very easy to find. If you Google uh, use AI to promote my music, there are tons now that will come up. And Google's pretty good at ranking them. So trust the top three or four that they um, suggest. Try them out. There's usually, um, you know, a free or a seven day trial, something like that, that you can utilize to, you know, see if it works for you. Now, are um, you saying that you can use that in place of a distributor? I wouldn't say in place, but I would say in addition to or in, in alignment with. So you can... Wow. Okay, what was the latest? I'm just going to find it right now. I know dead air is bad in, in these types of things, but okay. Muso, M-U-S-O, AI. Oh, yes, I have heard of that. Okay, Muso S -S -A AI is good because it'll help you track wherever your music is. Um, So as you, let's say you do use a distro kit or United Masters, you know, a lot of times people rely on those services. They usually have, you know, their artist platform like Spotify for artists has their thing and that you know so they'll give you the data and analytics to your release but you can't always depend on those to be honest with you um and you don't have it all in one place you have to go to spotify and then you go to apple and yeah and then you'll go to like the mlc where you get paid from mm -hmm. and it it don't it won't match what is happening over you know yep. so uh muso uh, ai is good because it's just another one that kind of uh you know puts it all together for you and helps you track it got it yeah. that's great um, well, yeah, I definitely encourage everybody to check out the book um, and it will it will help you get prompts on even how to ask, like, what is the current thing for this or that? Yes. Um, I am curious, since you talked about that, the Udio thing and how it mm -hmm. made such an amazing song. Like, what is the what is the future of artists with all of this AI <laughs> going on? When I said I know what question you're I know, ask. I, I realized that I bet you that's what he thinks I'm going to ask. Yeah. And it's the right question. It's the right question. And I don't know if I have the right answer to just be honest with you. 
uh, because we're in an interesting time right now. This stuff is moving so fast. Udio didn't exist three months ago. And the ones that were, that, uh, you know, predated Udio weren't very good. So it's come a long way in a relatively short amount of time. The next five years will be very, very interesting for artists. I will say this, um, as an artist, as a creator, you're going to need to be good. <laughs> you know, to start with, you're going to need to be good. You're going to need to work hard, work on your output. It's not enough to sit in a studio and just create and just hope that good things happen. You have to be in the market. You have to be actively promoting yourself and you have to be performing live. I think the one thing that AI is further away from replacing is the live performance aspect. Now, maybe not if you live in Korea, because 75,000 people will attend a hologram performance of an artist and pay a top dollar ticket for it. It's not here yet in America and, and not in other certain places. So I think we're a ways away from that. But in the music creation side of things, it might get a little scary. Now, here's the thing, though, that I think is probably good news for us all is that companies like the Recording Academy, you know, executives like Big John and, and Sony and other powerful you know, people that support true artistry are actively, you know, going to Congress and trying to, you know, get limitations put on AI and the platforms uh, that utilize it, uh, primarily in the licensing side of things. Because like with Udio, it generated that music from somewhere and from somebody. It's it's not an AI that's sitting in the studio like, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, right. that, that's got to be based on somebody's voice. That's right. Right. Yep. Somebody's voice, somebody's chord structure, somebody's. Yep. Yeah. And so I think what will happen is ultimately, I think these I think the powers that be in our music world will establish either blanket licensing agreements with certain AI platforms that, OK, it's OK for you to access, you know, music to you know create derivatives off of but you're gonna have to license it and we're gonna charge you a yearly fee so that our artists get something just like a a spotify or anybody else right if you want to be able to stream music yeah so and then i think also that music will eventually just like an i uh isrc or irsc code right or upc i think there will be an a uh, human authentication wow. i think yeah I think so. Uh, ultimately, and I don't know how soon. This might be five to 10 years. Maybe I'll be the one to write it. Who knows? But <laughs> I, th <laughs> I think there'll be a human authentication code that verifies that this music was solely created by a human. Because a friend of mine, Harvey Mason, the president of the Recording Academy, after the Uzi Vert and Drake release last year, took to his Instagram and said, no song created by AI would ever be considered for Grammy nomination. Mm -hmm. And my question, I didn't ask him, I didn't have the guts to do that, but I said to myself, how would you know? That's right. How would you know? How would you know? And and that, I think, will be answered with whatever this authenticator could or couldn't be. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I know. I, I keep thinking in my mind, like, there's got to be something for artists that is, you know, their uniqueness, their authenticity, there's something that, you know, I, AI can't reproduce. But then I, if I really think about it, it's like, well, it could be trained to reproduce that, you know? So it's like, dang it. Yeah, <laughs> it can. It can. Wow. You know, everybody fought the whole, uh, the auto-tune thing, remember? In mm -hmm. the uh, late, mid-90s, auto-tune was like, introduced and everybody was like no I'm not using that and I'll never use it now you can't put a song out without using it I, I think AI will become that I think it will be a part of everybody's process and and I think the the uh the hoopla that everybody's going through right now I think will be past us I don't think you know what I mean yeah now I don't I'll know. definitely have to have you on like in a few years and yeah. see what has happened. <laughs> we'll do it again. I'll probably be all gray by then. I'll probably <laughs> just have like <laughs> me too. I'll have the full on, you know, Chinese, you know, guru uh, beard. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, OK, so tell everybody how they can get your book and how okay. they can get connected with you online. OK, you can find the book on Amazon. Uh, music at the speed of AI. You can find it on uh, Barnes and Noble. You can find it on Walmart, or you can find it at my publisher, uh, Kendall Hunt. 
uh, dot com as well, all under the name. Or I think you can also search my name, Jason Edmonds, and you can find it uh, that way as well. Awesome. And are you on social media? Yep, I have to be. <laughs> um, I'm on Instagram uh, uh, at JP Edmonds. I'm on Facebook at Jason Edmonds 01, I think it is. It's all over the place because when I first signed up, you know, you could only own what you could get, you know. Yep. Uh, I am on TikTok. I think it's something like, I think it's just my name there, Jason Edmonds. And then I, uh, I'm on X, this Twitter thing, but it's weird. I'm I'm never there. It's, it confuses me now. So <laughs> <laughs> me too. I got yeah, it. Yeah, too much. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge about uh, artists, A and R, and branding, and and we got into the AI stuff and release. It's just going to be really helpful for everybody that was watching or listening. So I want to thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge and experience. I hope so, and thank you for having me, Bree. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.